So we'll start with some memory errors and some gaps in memory, uh, and we'll just go through a couple of examples to illustrate this. The first, in 1992, a cargo plane lost power to both of its engines and crashed into an apartment building. This was in Amsterdam, and 43 people lost their lives, including the entire plane crew. Uh, it was a highly emotional event, especially there, and it was much discussed after the incident. Ten months later, 192 Dutch people were asked if they had seen a television film of the moment the plane hit the apartment building itself. Now, only 107 out of the 193 people remembered the video footage of that plane crashing. Strangely enough, there was no video footage of that plane ever hitting the building, nor was there ever a time where any type of video or visual reenactment was conducted. So those 107 people remembered something that didn't actually exist. Further, in a follow-up study, 93 people were asked if they had seen the video of that crash along with details about it. When we're talking about details about it, they asked subjects if they had seen the plane come down vertically or horizontally, if the plane was on fire before it crashed or caught flames as soon as it hit the building, things like this. And in this, in this case, 67% or about two thirds of people reported seeing that film. And please remember, there's no such film that exists. And when asked about things like the plane's speed, only 23%, that is a little bit less than a quarter of people said they couldn't remember while the remainder provided various responses, things like it was going really fast or slow or speeding downwards or some such. Now, it is interesting that so many people came up with some type of response, especially since they never saw the plane crash in the first place. Um, if that is confusing and you think that these people might just be old and pre-dementia pathed individuals, uh, that is not the case. These are just average human beings, and this is actually fairly representative of human beings in general. We will talk a lot more about why this was probably the case. Let's look at an example where someone does not have to remember so far back. Note with the plane example, they were remembering out or they were remembering an event that took place 10 months prior and for the second follow-up a couple of years prior. Now, here is a case where they had participants show up, they were going to take part in some type of study, and here 30 participants were asked to wait in a room prior to taking part in the actual experiment itself. And here is a picture of that room that they actually sat in, and so they only sat there for about 35 seconds. And if you'll notice, that's probably how long it took for that picture to disappear. Now. Can you remember what all was in that room? I'll give you a second to just sort of think about that. Well, when they were asked to report on what was in this room, almost every single one of them correctly reported that there was a chair and desk in this room. But nine out of 30 people, that's almost a third of people, remembered seeing some books in that picture and there were no books there in that photo. Now, we will talk about this at length later, but one of the things that is indicated by this and the previous example is that our recollections ultimately are strongly guided by our schemata. Schemata is just the plural for schema, and in this case, that schemata or schema was what expectations we have of an academic professor's office. And most, if we were asked to think about what a stereotypical office for a professor would be like, we would most likely include books in that office. And therefore, or according to this example at least, when we are trying to recall a memory or an event that we just took part in or took part a long time ago and we are having difficulty remembering the details, we will oftentimes fill in those details with our expectations. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the hypotheses behind memory errors. Just a little recap from last lecture, we had talked about how memories can be conceptualized as ultimately a vast interconnected set of ideas. 
And now that does, of course, beg the question, how do we keep our memories separate? If there are no clean delineations between how they are stored in the brain, how is it that when we think about our memories, we're able to think about them ultimately individually, or at least we have the subjective experience of experiencing them individually? So generally speaking, the concepts and ideas that together form our memories or form, let's say, a particular memory in this case, tend to be more tightly connected to each other. You will often hear that talked about as they're wired more strongly together. And this tends to be more the case than ideas or concepts that are not unified into a singular type of memory. Uh, just a high level example of that would be oftentimes we think of birthdays and cakes going together and so the nodes representing birthdays and cakes are probably more strongly wired together. While we probably tend not to think about birthday parties and taking exams simultaneously, and so the nodes representing birthday parties and exams are probably not very highly connected. Now, there is, of course, room for error because just because some are more tightly wound together than others does not mean this is a binary situation where only those that go together are tied together, but rather it's shades of gray. And so, here what happens when you have two memories that are extremely similar. For example, let's say last week I went and ate cookies at a red cafe, it didn't actually happen, and let's say this week I went and got cookies at a blue cafe, and both of those cookies are just, they were so delicious, and the cafes were super cozy, and well, all that was different was one had a warm red shade and the other had a warm blue shade, and then you ask me about where I got that delicious cookie I'm eating today, and I'm like, I got it from the, was it the red cafe or the blue cafe? And this tends to happen to many people a lot, actually. And one of the reasons this tends to happen is because both of those memories and the architecture underlying them are very, very similar. And remember how we've talked about before, our memories are not unique recordings each and every time, but rather we continually generate our memories from more and more basic components and features. And so most of the features involved in representing good cookies and cafes are ultimately the same sets of features with only subtle differences. When it comes to memories like that, it becomes very easy to confuse certain attributes from one memory with another memory. And this can be explained by our original understanding of how memory is ultimately just a huge network of interconnected ideas. In a similar vein, the more we think about and analyze our memories, the more strongly our memory nodes become linked to the thoughts and analysis of those memories. So what I mean here is that when I have some kind of recollection, I have that memory and all of the various components involved in that memory. And now upon reflecting about that memory, those thoughts and understandings too are arising by activation through this network. And the more and more I think about certain aspects of some part of a memory and how it relates to say some other memory, I am beginning to tie those two sets of things together more and more strongly. And now whenever I go back and try and remember this memory, it will no longer be just that memory, but I will also likely remember other components that I have thought about over the intervening time. An example of this would just be, you know, if I spend a couple weeks thinking about why I did not stop for a cookie after the fact, of course, and then some time later you were to ask me why I didn't stop, I might tell you the reasoning I had for not stopping and getting a cookie, and I might tell you that story as if I had had those thoughts prior to me not stopping, which in fact is not actually the case. I just didn't stop for whatever reason, and then I thought about the fact that I didn't have a cookie and why I did not stop, and on later reflection, I get that time order messed up because now I'm confusing the memories of actually not stopping with my memories of trying to think about why I did not stop in the first place. Okay, we have talked previously about how understanding helps our memory. Today we'll talk a little bit about how it hurts our memory as well. So it helps our memory because the more we understand, the more we are integrating novel concepts into previous information and knowledge that we have. 
speaking in terms of this network concept, ultimately what we are doing is when we are trying to understand, we are more richly integrating new units and nodes into the existing network. This ultimately allows for more ways in which we can retrieve specific memories. But this increased interconnectivity can also lead to the same type of memory problems we talked about on that previous slide. The more strongly I interconnect lots and lots of different concepts and ideas together, it does make it ultimately easier for me to remember those various concepts and ideas just because of the vast network that is now interconnecting all of these nodes, but it can make it more likely that I will begin to confuse certain aspects of some memories with others because of that high interconnectivity between these nodes. When we make those type of errors, they are generally called intrusion errors, where some unrelated piece of knowledge or information is on is intruding into our memories and causing us to ultimately have some type of memory error. A little example of how this works. So here people were given one of two passages. So they were either given the following passage, I'm sure you can read it, but I will just read it for you in case you're not looking at the screen. So Nancy arrived at the cocktail party. She looked around the room to see who was there. She went to talk with her professor. She felt she had to talk to him, but was a little nervous about what to say. A group of people started to play charades. Nancy went over and had some refreshments. The hors d'oeuvres were good, but she wasn't interested in talking to the rest of the people at the party. After a while, she decided she had had enough and left the party. Now, one half of participants received this. The other half of participants received that same passage, except this time they got an additional few sentences. The additional sentences were, Nancy woke up feeling sick again, and she wondered if she really was pregnant. How would she tell the professor she had been seeing? And money was another problem. So after reading one of these two variants, subjects were asked to recall as many of the statements in the passage they had just read as possible and to do so as accurately as possible. Now you could just for a second, I suppose, pause and make a guess as to what happened. Well. I'm just going to turn on a pointer. So let us look first here. The theme condition is the thing or the condition in which they gave this sort of preamble, where now you know why Nancy is going to this party and why she's nervous about talking to the professor. And here you can see that on average, these people tended to remember more propositions accurately than those in the neutral condition. The neutral condition just being those who received the statement without the prologue which is great. This fits in line with what we talked about last time is the more we can build complex narratives and have understanding, the more likely we are to remember events and aspects of those memories. While the more neutral and less impactful it is, we tend to not remember as well. Now, in this set of boxes here, you can see that we have the opposite pattern for incorrect inferences. Now, what we mean by these inferred propositions or incorrect inferences is something to the effect of, let's say, the professor got Nancy pregnant, which people tended to remember a lot, even though it is not actually present in the story that was given. It could be inferred from it, but it was not actually present. And so saying that this was a sentence that you had seen prior would technically be an incorrect response. Uh, just in case, the studied propositions here would be something like Nancy arrived at the cocktail party, which was present in the statement itself. Now, here you can see that in the neutral condition, those who did not get this passage, they only incorrectly added about 3.7 propositions, whereas those who were in the narrative or received that prologue condition tended to make a lot more of these inference-based errors. And ultimately, what is going on? it's likely that those who received the story, the more rich story, were more richly integrating it with previous understanding they had. Things like television shows or novels or even, unfortunately, personal life experience. And those ultimately are now contaminating the original memory of the prompt that they just read, leading them to make much more incorrect inferences, even though their overall memory for what was there was better. Now, 
is one better than the other? Not necessarily. It's just a matter of different types of patterns that the more richly interconnected you bring novel ideas in with, the more likely you are to remember aspects of that novel material, but also the more likely you are to have intrusion based errors. Another way of finding incorrect memories is something called the DRM procedure. It is doesn't have a fancy name or anything like this. It is just named after the three researchers who came up with it. And it is a procedure that yields a large number of memory errors. And it does so even when you inform participants that this procedure is likely to result in a large degree of memory errors. Now the procedure itself involves giving participants a list of themed or related words and then they're asked to recall these words at some later time and these words are related to as i said some theme and that label for that theme and other words not present in the list but also related to that theme are then presented to participants later on along with the original words themselves and they are asked to make a determination of whether they saw this word that they're now being shown in the previous list or not and so just an example to make this more concrete, here would be an example list. So here we would have bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, and drowsy. Uh, probably pretty obvious what the thematic word is there, something to do with sleep. And here you can see what happens. Participants were very good at being able to actually remember all of the words from the list. This is just probably just good at being able to remember along with a theme unifying all of these ideas. So even if they did forget one or two of those words, the chances are that the overall theme and being able to recall certain ones of those words is going to activate other words that might have been close to being forgotten. When it came to unrelated words that they were asked whether they had seen them or not, they were very good at being able to say that they had not seen them. You can see by this very low bar that very, very few cases were such that they saw one of these unrelated words and mistakenly attributed to the list they had just seen. When it came to words that re related to the theme of the words that they were presented, like if I had shown the word sleep, in this case, people falsely identified those words as being on the list at about the same rate as they were able to for the words that were actually there. It is just a way to show the high interconnectivity between items that exist in the brain can yield great benefits, allowing us to have very, very good memories, but it can also result in very specific types of memory errors. All right, a little bit about schematic knowledge. So schematic knowledge refers to our knowledge of how certain events are supposed to be. For example, you're supposed to get menus at a restaurant. Well, most restaurants that you sit down and order food at. Um, so this ultimately could lead to a situation like this. If you had gone to a restaurant and eaten some food and you were coming back and you were telling your friend about, oh, the meal was great and the ambiance was really nice and the server was cool and the drinks were awesome, so on and so forth. And then your friend is like, oh, uh, well, what was on the menus and what did they look at? And or even better yet, they ask if you were even given a menu or was it just some sort of chef special type of thing? And you who were not really paying much attention to when you got those menus and rather just chose something and moved on with your life to enjoy the nice cocktail and meal, so to speak, would probably have no trouble saying, yes, I did in fact get a menu at that restaurant, even if you have no recollection whatsoever of seeing that menu. And now this is ultimately not because you remember the menu itself, but because you know that you're supposed to get a menu at the restaurant and therefore, even if you don't recall the instance, you would be probably fairly confident saying you got the menu. And oftentimes these schemas or schemata will influence where we direct our attention and this intention in turn influences what we will remember. 
Remember we talked a lot about you have to be able to attend to certain types of events or stimuli in order to encode them into memory. And so anything that changes how we direct our attention is likely to change how our memories ultimately are formed and what aspects of our memories we will be able to carry forward versus other ones that will sort of fade away. Now, if we don't actually remember something, we may quote unquote remember what fits with our schemas. Now, all I mean by this is like I was talking about with the menu. We might not actually remember seeing the menu, but we will remember having gotten a menu even if we don't actually remember it. All we're really doing here is just filling in those blank spaces with what we expect to be the case. This is one of the reasons why we can drive along a commute many, many, many times before seeing some establishment or building change because we're not actually necessarily paying attention to all of our surroundings because we know what it's supposed to be like. Okay, thinking back to those books in the professor's office, so here, I had mentioned this on that slide as well, but books are supposed to be in a professor's office, and so it makes sense that oftentimes they will get misremembered, because if a person doesn't really remember what all was in the room, it's probably a safe bet to bet on remembering that they were books in a professor's office. What about the plane video that never actually happened? Well, it's probably good to think about where most people in the 90s got their news from. Yes, they did still read newspapers at that time, just like some people still do today, but they did not really have much social media, and most of them watched the news on a television where they saw video reports of much of the news. It makes sense that when asked about the video of the plane, maybe they don't actually remember the video itself, but it is so common to get news media through videos at the time, they didn't have much trouble remembering the video that never was. Okay, a little bit about the cost of memory errors. Well, they can be existentially worrying, because I basically have been telling you now for a little while that we can make all types of memory errors, and it then makes it a little bit weird thinking about our own memories. Of course, you probably will never have the subjective experience of not having a trustworthy memory, because most of us tend to think about our memories as being trustworthy, or like video recordings of the past, which unfortunately they are not. That being said, most of those type of costs tend to just be personal and subjective, and many of us think about it occasionally and then disregard it and go on with our lives. They can, however, be some much more costly errors. So, as technology has become more and more advanced, we've begun to use DNA testing in criminal cases. And not only can we use this criminal or DNA testing in criminal cases, but we can also begin to use that technology to either confirm or exonerate people who were previously convicted. Many times this is done because people kept samples at the time of those crimes and just didn't have the technology to analyze it. And then as technology advanced, we have begun to be able to use it to prove or falsify whether people were indeed guilty. And it is sad to say, but there are quite a number of people who ultimately have been exonerated with this methodology. And approximately three out of every four of such cases were cases that relied on eyewitness testimony to prove that the person was guilty, even when they were not. Then we did talk a little bit about how it is very difficult to actually see faces from very far away. But another aspect of this here, specific to this, is how well we are actually able to remember the face of a person we maybe only saw for a very brief time in an emotionally charged situation. And the truth is, a lot of times we might believe that we saw someone even if we never actually saw them. And we will talk a little bit about different ways in which that system can become more or less biased. 
Okay, uh, we'll talk a little bit about planting false memories. So we'll talk about these two forms over the next couple slides, but they generally fall under the ideas of either using leading questions to change a person's recollection of some previous event, or using some type of misinformation to either alter or actually even create new false memories. So a little bit about car accidents. This is actually quite a famous study, but here participants were shown a series of photos about an automobile collision. And a little while later, they were asked to estimate the speed at which those cars were traveling. Subjects were, however, asked to estimate this speed when the two cars hit each other, and another set of participants were asked to estimate their speed when the two cars smashed into each other. Now, they all saw the same set of photographs, and would you expect that this makes a difference in their estimates of speed? I mean, probably so, because I only ever asked those questions when something weird happens, but hey. So here's kind of what happened. So you can see that hit sits here and smash sits there, and people estimated the speed as being quite a bit higher when it was smashed versus hit. I think it's about 43 to 32 miles an hour was the estimates. You can see that as the words change and result in higher, higher semantic, um, I don't want to use the word impact because the cars are impacting, but just as the sort of visual salience of high speed collisions increases with the use of these words, you can see that people's estimates of speed continues to increase. Low estimates for contacted and hit, bumped is kind of in the middle and collided and smashed result higher and higher. Okay, that just changes how we are making estimates of things and well, what does that have to do with memory? Well, a week later, participants were asked about how much glass they remember seeing in the photographs. Now there wasn't actually any glass in any of the photographs. And those that answered that smashed question and overestimated the speed, well, overestimated might not be right because they were still photographs, so you can't really tell. But those who received the question about estimating speed and were asked when the cars smashed each other tended to misremember that there was glass present while those who answered the hit question tended to not remember seeing the glass, or in this case, accurately respond that there was no glass in the collision. Now, this is just showing how our memories ultimately can be biased over time by the manner in which we are asked other questions. It is ultimately the estimate question that they were asked that resulted in their overestimation of them seeing glass when there was no glass. And that's the case because the only difference between these two groups of people was one set saw were they what speed were they traveling when they hit each other and the other was what speed were they traveling when they smashed into each other. And ultimately here what's happening is the idea of smashed, not only in terms of cars, but across many, many other domains is much, much more likely tied to broken glass and imagery that evokes similar things than hit is. Whereas if I was to talk about black eyes in the picture, it could well be that I would have remembered much more black eyes after receiving this hit question than the smashed question. And this is just again showing how that interconnectivity can ultimately lead to confusion between different types of memories, even to the point of misremembering certain features of a previous event. Now, this one is a little bit more wild. So the misinformation effect is ultimately talking about memory errors that result from some form of post-event misinformation. What that means is, you know, you have some event that occurred in the past, and now you have someone who tells you about that event at some more present time, and this influences, one, what we remember, and two, if we remember things that might never have actually happened. So to demonstrate this, a group of experimenters got a list of childhood events from the parents of a bunch of college students, and they then added, of course, some filler ones in there just because that's what the experiment was about. They found the college students, and then they went about asking them if they remembered those events at all. 
and students were correctly able to recall over 80% of those actual events. And that's pretty good because, you know, we we're talking about events that happened on the order of 10 or 15 years prior. Now, during that initial interview, no students remembered the fake events that the experimenters just put in there. And you would say that that's probably pretty great because they never actually happened and to remember things that never actually happened would be kind of weird. They were, however, interviewed multiple times after this event or after the experimenters asked them about these previous events in their past that either did or did not happen. And by the third interview now, as many as 25%, the quarter of all of those college students remembered some event that never took place. And this in this line of experiment, I believe it was they spilled a punch bowl on the groom's parents at a wedding. Never actually happened. Now, this is just repeatedly asking about some event that happened in the past and people then over time seem to have begun to remember an event that never took place. What about if you can provide evidence though? Well, in those cases, it goes much higher. Here, as many as 80% of people tend to remember this event. So what did experimenters do here? They again asked parents for a bunch of photographs from their childhood, which they then superimposed onto other photos. So if you look carefully, you will see that there is the kid and the dad or uncle or strange man who is something, I don't know, it's probably the dad. Anyway, they superimposed these here on the photo and then they showed this photo, this faked photo to the students and asked if they remember that hot air balloon and well almost 80 percent of people remembered taking this hot air balloon ride when it never happened now just a quick side note um i am not sure if you have heard until now but there are more and more on the internet something called deep fakes deep fakes are ultimately computerized creations of other people. They are ultra realistic and you can make them say all kinds of things. Uh, one of the most widely spread that came around a little while ago was Obama saying lots of hateful, sexist and racist things, even though he'd never actually said those things, but they ultimately created a model of him and made a video of that model, which looks just like him and sounds just like him saying a bunch of stuff. Now, in the world where we can now begin to make such great fakes, right? Not superimposing one photo onto another photo. We could make entire videos that show you living an event that never actually happened. In such a case, what might you remember? Okay, just a quick side note here because I feel like I have said a lot about how you cannot trust memories in a lot of the cases. On average, our memories are actually really, really good. They are fairly complete. They're quite detailed, actually. They last a long time. And like I said, for the most part, they are pretty spot on. Okay, when it does come to confidence in memories, well, this now shows an interesting pattern. Oftentimes, when we are hearing somebody else talk about a memory, the more confident they are talking about that memory, the more likely we are to believe that it is true. The lower the confidence with which they tell us about those memories, the less likely we are to think they are true. Now, it turns out, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the lecture, the accuracy of our memories is ultimately independent from the confidence in which we feel that memory is true. Many of us have had the experience where something has been shown to us and we've remembered it otherwise, and we say, I could have sworn it was like this, not that. And that's a case where ultimately our memory is incorrect, but we have very, very high confidence in our memory. Now, where this can lead to problems in real life is that this confidence level we have in our memories can ultimately be manipulated. So an example here that the data is shown for, they're looking at, first of all, it was a simulated case, so it wasn't really actually a crime that was committed, but you know, you can then imagine that similar 
methods or processes happen in actual daily life. And here what they did is they modified the feedback people got after selecting somebody from a lineup. Now, please note, they gave feedback after they selected from the lineup. So who they pulled out of the lineup should have had nothing to do with their confidence levels. Now, some people were given no feedback after they pulled this person out of a lineup, right? They just pulled them out and they were thanked and then they could leave. They were not told whether that was the guilty party or not. Whereas another set were told, great, you have been able to successfully identify this culprit. Okay, here you can see the difference now in their confidence ratings about their selection. When people got no feedback whatsoever, they were a little bit under 50% in their confidence levels. Whereas when they were given some kind of feedback, that resulted in much, much higher confidence levels, which in a way makes sense because you were told you were right and now you can just be super confident that your memory was in fact correct. But what does this mean for actual real life? What if a police officer through whatever their own biases are is committed to having some culprit be the one who is quote unquote guilty of a crime and then someone pulls them out of a lineup and are actually told by this police officer "Ooh, good job you got the person and then they go to court and give their testimony and now with much greater confidence because they've gotten the feedback from the police officer are able to talk about how that is the person they saw Remember earlier when we said those who speak with higher confidence about their memories tend to have their memories judged as more true by others. So the jury now hearing this one testimony is more likely to believe it because of the confidence involved in telling about that memory. Now it is important to note also that this feedback need not be verbal. It could some be as simple as someone making a slight smile or nodding their head or something like that. And that often is enough to result in some kind of manipulation of the confidence we feel for our memories. Okay, let's talk a little bit about forgetting. So when you forget the name of someone you just met at a party, you are not actually forgetting, right? It is much more likely that you just were not actually paying a sufficient amount of attention to their name and it just didn't get encoded in the first place. It's not like in that snap minute where you had them tell you their name, they told you a joke and then you moved on with your lives, that you somehow remembered their name, encoded their name and then forgot their name much, much more likely that just simply attention was not paid and that name never got encoded. We're not actually going to talk about this as forgetting. Forgetting is specifically about when we have paid attention, encoded a memory, the memory is now in long-term storage and then somehow it is no longer accessible. Here are three hypotheses around how it is that that information is no longer accessible once it has been committed to long-term memory. So decay, decay refers to the idea of, oops, let me just turn this. Uh, okay. So decay refers to the idea that the connections between memories or between the components that make up those memories need to be refreshed, otherwise those connections gradually fade away. So this is actually something that is very common in the brain. The less and less you use certain neuronal pathways, the less activation flows through them, and the less activation that flows through them, the less strong those connection patterns become. Versus the more and more we think about something, do something, learn something, the more we use specific pathways in our brain and the more strongly those pathways ultimately become wired. A good analogy of this is if any of you have ever gone hiking, places that have sort of wild trails actually have trails that form pretty organically that none of the park rangers actually made but those trails are the result of people walking through them over and over and over and over time they form an actual trail in a very similar way the more and more we think about or do certain things we form ultimately neuronal pathways in an analogous manner the less and less we use them, however, the more overgrown they become and slowly one no longer has those pathways. 
So decay is one of the first hypotheses about why we ultimately forget stuff. If you don't use it for long enough, ultimately you lose it. Another hypothesis around forgetting is this idea of interference theory. And this is the idea that over time, when we learn new and new things, many of the features and new things we learn are related to older features in other things we had learned previously. And this new memory acquisitions ultimately interrupt the old memory architecture. And it is the acquisition of novel memories that ultimately lead to the destruction of older memories. And this could be a reason for why we forget. Um, please note that in this case, time is not actually causing our memories to degrade, but rather interference theory is correlated with time. That over time, we have more and more opportunities to learn new things. And the more and more new things we learn, the more our previous memories get degraded. The third is the idea of retrieval failure. So this is just where we are unable to find the specific memory in our brain. So we've talked a lot about retrieval pathways and pathways connecting different nodes and understanding helping memory because it increases the number of pathways. If you only had a memory with very few pathways, it is possible that you just will never get there because Either the current situation is not right, they're not the right stimulus is available to activate those memories, you're not being primed. There could be many, many reasons. And ultimately, if your activation flow does not find the nodes or clusters that you're after, you cannot retrieve that memory, even though it remains encoded in your long term memory. Now, when it comes to these three, it's not one versus the others. At any given time, all three of these are ultimately at play. And as I mentioned for interference theory, all of them are ultimately correlated with time. You could say that decay is caused by time, but causal stuff when it comes to the brain are pretty weird and generally want to avoid saying those types of things.
All right, finally, let's talk about autobiographical memories. Now, these are just memories that are concerned with episodes in one's own life. When it comes to memories in the self, uh, information that is relevant to the self tends to be remembered better than information that is not relevant to the self. Meaning things about you, you will remember better than things not about you. Uh, a nice real life example of this would be think about how well you remember directions when you yourself are the one who is driving versus you are in the passenger seat. We tend to remember directions much better when we are the one who is driving as opposed to being in the passenger side seat. And a lot of this can be explained because the directions are personally relevant when we are driving and they are not personally relevant when we are not driving. Uh, you could say that there's some attentional issues there, but that is more an example to get the point across. Nonetheless, there are still memory errors here as well. And one of the primary sources here is because of the schemas many of us have about ourselves. So we tend to believe that we are, generally speaking, more reasonable, consistent, and stable than we might actually be. And some of us are just very reasonable and consistent, but a lot of us tend not to be. And it's not to say that we're all crazy people, but just stuff in life happens that gets our feathers ruffled and makes us act in, un act in unreasonable or inconsistent ways. We tend not to always remember those because we don't remember every moment of our life. And when asked what we were likely doing in some circumstance, a lot of the time we will fill in those spaces with items and information that are congruent with our schemas of ourself. Also, when remembering to differing extents, at least, we do rely on these schemas to fill in our memories, right? So it is that when we are thinking about what we were doing in the past, the chances are we'll think about how we are and then use that to fill in what we were doing in the past. And this does have the side effect of making it seem to us that the past is much more like our current present than it actually was. You do tend to see this a lot with sort of current emotions. We, when we're in a really good place of mind, tend to perceive our past as being more positive than it was, just as much as when we are in a really bad or negative state of mind, we tend to perceive our past as being more negative than it actually was. So this does, of course, confer a fun side benefit. Well, you could say it's fun depending on how you feel about this. But it turns out that students are much more likely over time to remember A's, so when they did quite well. So here you can see that about 89% of students in this study correctly remembered when they had A's. But we tend not to remember as well when we don't do as well. Of course, this is not true for everybody, and this is over time. In the moment, it tends to be very difficult not to think about our failures. But over a while, we tend to start to forget our previous instances in which our performance was not as good as we expected to be, and therein lies the part of why. We tend to expect ourselves to behave in a certain way, and we will remember the items that fit with what we were expecting to come true. A little bit about memory consolidation. So this is the process through which memories are ultimately cemented into place. This just means they're solidified and it occurs without one actively thinking about it and generally pretty quickly after an event has occurred. Uh, you could say at most maybe a day or two. Well, for the primary consolidation at least. You could talk about how this also occurs over many, many years with every time I revisit a memory, it is further consolidated. But Particularly when we're talking about it like this, we're talking about when you're exposed to something, you think about something, you mull on something for a little while. This is ultimately, and behind the scenes at least more so, your memories are ultimately now being consolidated and integrated into the existing architecture of your brain. Uh, if this process is interrupted, ultimately no memory will be established and you cannot recall it later because no memory was established. Uh, this can be interrupted by either extreme fatigue, injuries, substance abuse, or extreme stress. So in all of these cases with fatigue, it just your brain performance degrades over time. Um, there's very interesting stories about extreme athletes and endurance people who have had to stay awake for many, many hours, and they will begin not only to have problems in their memory systems, but even their cognitive systems as well. 
Uh, if you receive some type of head injury, this can also lead to problems in consolidation. Substance abuse should probably go without saying. Um, and also extreme stress can cause problems with consolidation. Uh, a good analogy there is you can think about consolidation as a term of maintenance and imagine yourself as a car and if you were in extreme stress it would be like putting the car in neutral and stepping on the gas and just keeping that engine revving at 8000 rpms and then imagine trying to perform maintenance on the engine probably not going to work very well ultimately when we are under extreme amounts of stress and there is not a way in which we can resolve that stress it tends to ultimately manifest in our body just constantly trying to prepare itself for something and no outlet upon which to ever direct those energies. Uh, there is, of course, now increasing evidence that certain things can help with this process. So one of the primary ones that gets talked about a lot is a good night's rest. So it does seem to be, even though we don't 100% understand the ins and outs of the dreaming brain and why we need sleep, it does in turn seem to be the case that with sleep, specifically with dreams, and like I said, good night's rest, the process of memory consolidation tends to be more robust than if that is robbed from us. Another thing that helps a lot is emotions, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide. So in regard to consolidation, emotional triggers tend to evoke higher activation in the amygdala, and the amygdala in turn increases activity in the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is very strongly involved in establishing new memories. Uh, just to remember about the hippocampus and memories, just think back to patient HM who went in to have their epilepsy treated and ultimately had a portion of their hippocampus cut out and from that moment on was unable to create any new memories. Um, a quick note on the amygdala. A lot of times when we talk about the amygdala, we talk about it in its relation to fear and fear-based stimuli. More and more we have begun to talk about the amygdala as a part of a salience network, meaning it helps us attend to things that are important and a lot of times triggers or stimuli that result in emotional responses tend to be fairly salient and thus we see a lot of activation in the amygdala. Also, emotional events tend to be quite important to the person who is experiencing the emotion, else why would you be having the emotions in the first place? And that makes us pay much more attention because it is now personally relevant to us and important. Not only does that increased attention help with the formation of these memories, but oftentimes we tend to mull over emotional events after they have concluded for some time after they're done. And this is ultimately analogous to memory rehearsal, where we are going over the item to be remembered again and again and again. And this does help us solidify our memories. Finally, emotions can also change what items we pay attention to. Uh, we have found that we do tend to notice or pay attention to things that are congruent with our emotions. We tend to focus more on happy things when we are in a happy state of mind and more on sad things when we are in a sad state of mind. And this change of attention, what is now being ultimately thought of as modifying what parts of the environment we are paying attention to, will change what parts of the environment we ultimately encode into long-term memory and which ones we don't. If you're not paying attention to something, you're not really going to remember it. And this process does help guarantee that things we pay attention to make it into memory because a lot of times when it's highly emotional, our attention becomes very narrowly focused on those items, unfortunately at the cost of not encoding most of the other aspects around the environment. And so, as with everything, there are pros and cons, and the more narrowly we pay attention to something, increasing the odds of remembering that, the less likely we are to remember everything else that is around it. Okay, a little bit about flashbulb memories. These are just memories that have extraordinary clarity and tend to be retained for a very long time. So they're often remembered very vividly for very, very many years, and typically they are related to highly emotional events. So examples of these would be where you were when the World Trade Center bombing happened in September 2001, or where you were when Michael Jackson died in 2009. 
And a lot of times when we think back to these monumental moments in our lives, we remember them with a clarity above and beyond our normal memories. Now, please remember early on we talked about confidence in our memories is not actually related to the accuracy of those memories. Speaking of, when it came to that World Trade Center bombing, approximately 3,000 people were interviewed very quickly after the event happened, and then they were given up a follow-up interview one year later where they were asked the same questions they were given when they were interviewed directly after the incident. And in this case, 37% of people provided sets of answers that were pretty different than the interview questions. I mean, that's almost 40% of people now who have modified their understanding of the event, even though their memory of the event seems crystal clear and they are very confident that's exactly what happened. In another follow-up interview three years later, this number went up to 43% where they now provided a different set of answers than they had originally given right after the event. Now, despite these accuracy rates, confidence ratings in their memories was incredibly high. The average rating across all of these various post interviews was about 4.41 out of five. Now, that is not to say that some people did not remember extremely well. We're saying at most 43% of people gave wildly different answers, implying that a little over 55% of people actually gave really good answers and were pretty accurate. And one thing that leads to these deviations is how often and with whom do we discuss these memories. If we tend to discuss the memories a lot, it could potentially solidify those memories, making them more robust to time. But it is also possible in discussing these memories with other people, we begin to contaminate our original memories with memories of our discussions with other people or our thoughts about that event. And of course, because our confidence remains so high and these intrusion errors are largely unconscious, it is difficult to say when such a memory has been contaminated or not. And on that vein, from the point of the person who has the memory, there is no detectable difference between an accurate memory and an inaccurate one. They both feel as if you were still there. And that is completely divorced from whether it actually happened the way you remember it or not. Okay, uh, the next slide is a little bit about traumatic memories. So people often have strong feelings about traumatic experiences and specifically repression of memories around such traumatic experiences. Um, if this is a topic that is triggering for you, you can just advance through this and you will not suffer any loss in continuity to the lecture itself. Just giving you a moment. Okay. So when it comes to memories for traumatic events, they tend to be remembered really, really well, much like flashbulb memories. Now, that being said, they are not always remembered well or accurately for that matter. But let's talk a little bit about when they're not remembered. A lot of times this gets talked about as the repression of traumatic memories. Now, this is actually pretty controversial among memory researchers, many arguing that such a process is unlikely to be the case. Um, it does often get talked about when it is talked about in sort of non-memory research related circles as a protection mechanism that is helping us from reliving these sort of traumatic or horrific events. And that unfortunately doesn't make the most sense from a biological basis. If you were to think about something that caused you a huge degree of trauma, to now force yourself to forget it is just going to increase the chances that you would go through something similar in the future. Not only more likely are you to go through it, but you would be going through it without the knowledge that you had the first time of what saw you through the traumatic event in the first place. To forcibly make you forget that event doesn't seem like the most effective protection mechanism. After all, if you were to really, really badly burn your hand on a stove and then forget about it, 
you would be more likely to burn your hand again in the future only to then forget about it again and you would just keep doing this over and over. I mean, maybe not every moment of your life, but the chances are much higher than someone who remembers the pain of the burn and no longer touches that stove. I'm not saying it's impossible, just currently a lot of the thinking is it is unlikely. So other reasons that could include or could be why we do not remember these things, a lot of these fall under the ideas of consolidation we were talking earlier, sleep deprivation is a huge one, Oftentimes, people who have just gone through a traumatic experience tend to have great difficulty in having good sleep, and this could lead to lots of consolidation problems with their memory. Another is head injuries. A lot of traumatic events could include head injuries, which lead to problems with memory. Substance abuse is unfortunately another very common response after traumatic experiences, and a lot of substance abuse can lead to problems with memories extreme stress like we discussed further and finally there could just be an unwillingness on the part of the person who has these memories and went through the event to talk about them and a lot of times when people don't want to talk about something others are not always willing to just listen and give them space and so ultimately what many people might be forced to do is to say i don't remember it unfortunately is very hard to disentangle all of these different pieces and how they're contributing to a memory just not being shared or a memory not actually had. Finally, a little bit about the recovery of memories that have been suppressed. So there is also some controversy around this. So a lot of this could just be related to retrieval failure, right? It's not so much that I repressed a memory and then now recovered the memory as I just was unable to access that memory at that particular time and at some later time I was able to now remember it. Uh, a banal example of this would be you think you need something from another room, you walk into that room and you just forget no matter what you do, you just don't know why you walked into that room. And then you go back to your original room and you're like, ha ha, I actually was gonna go try and get a brownie or some such. This is not that you've now spontaneously recovered your memory, but rather you now have gone into a situation where your stimuli have just reinstantiated that memory because activation has now successfully found the correct nodes. Also, a lot of times when people recover such memories, they tend to recover such memories with the assistance of a therapist. And a lot of times therapists can have their own preconceived notions about what could be the cause of a person's trauma or stress or psychological problems and those unconscious well they might consciously be aware of those biases but those biases can tend to leak out consciously or unconsciously and influence the person who is now trying to come up with or who is in therapy trying to resolve some repressed memory that might not actually have been there that being said, sometimes these memories are very accurate and sometimes they're not. And ultimately, it is difficult to say one way or the other. And just because many of the times these memories tend to be related to very horrible instances in people's pasts and very emotionally graphic, does not change the fact that sometimes they're accurate and sometimes they're not. And in cases where this can determine people's future lives, it is important for us to be careful and thorough in trying to understand what actually happened and not just relying on emotionality and confidence to determine whether a memory is accurate or not. Okay, a little bit about long, long-term remembering, but that would just mean remembering over years and years and years, and we're actually pretty good at it. I'm just gonna turn that pointer back on. So this is just a graph showing how well people, one, remembered names of people after they had been in a class with them, along with concepts in a psychology class. You can see that they had about 80% of successful memory within three months of that happening. And then this pretty much slowly and steadily degrades out to about three years. And at three years, it remains pretty much at a constant level until out to a decade later where they stop measuring. And it remains at the rate of about 65%. So 
this memory paradigm was done with basically a familiar or not paradigm, meaning just they were shown items and asked, do you know this or do you not? And they were ultimately then responding yes or no, and that led to this percentage. So this line here represents chance that if I knew nothing at all, I would select yes and no at arbitrary rates, and I should see values here. That I have a consistent line above this shows that our memory, while not perfect, is actually quite good for incredibly long periods of time. Uh, just a fun one there, but I mean, have you been able to keep a file on a flash drive for 10 years and five months? Ooh. Okay, uh, a little bit of memories over lifetimes. So patterns are remarkably similar across cultures, meaning that this is probably just a basic aspect of the Homo sapien model and not something that is culturally specific. Here you can see a graph of different countries, Japan, Bangladesh, the United Kingdom, China, the United States, and just an average of all of them. And here you can see that we have very few memories of our early years, even though it seems like Americans tend to remember a lot of stuff in their really, really early years, meaning zero to five. Uh, there's huge debate on how much of that is possible or not, but anyhow, you can see that as you get older, going through your teenage years and your twenties, we tend to remember a lot of memories and then the amount of new memories that we have sort of degrades over time. And a lot of this tends to just be related to during our adolescence, we're kind of discovering ourselves and experimenting with things. And in our 20s, we're either going to college or being trained in professions and we're discovering our life and starting families and getting loans and bank accounts and just becoming adults. And there are a lot of huge milestones we hit during this time period which could be related to why we have so memory, so many memories of that event. And as we get older and older, more of the days kind of blur together unless we're actively taking effort to keep ourselves engaged. Also, this says nothing whatsoever about the accuracy of our memories. While we could have many, many memories in our 20s, whether those memories are true or not is, well, debatable. And the truth is many of the memories we have about our 20s are not going to change our lives so dramatically when we are 60. So fighting with other people who are in their 60s about whether the memories were true or not, if it's not something directly relevant to your livelihood, well, who really knows? And since we're not actually video recording every single moment of our lives, how can you really know? But then again, maybe that will change as we march into the future. Right? Thank you.